thanks for everyone that made this possible. Uh, this has been really great so far, and hopefully the greatness hasn't stopped. So, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to continue where we left off with the last lecture. Uh, I'm going to be talking about these optomechanical microwave circuits. Uh, this picture is uh, a zoom in of one of the wafers where we produce many, many chips. On each of these chips are many, many little microwave circuits with little drums in them. And today's lecture, I'm going to focus mostly on the, the, showing you some of the data that's come out of our lab in the past couple of years. Uh, again, this is a collaboration between our group at NIST, some of the works, uh, collaborating with Conrad later in July. So, just roughly speaking, uh, I'll be talking about uh, Two main papers, uh, ones where we saw effects of uh, interference between pumps and probes and optomechanical systems. We've already heard a little bit about this. I'll show you that the, the data really can look like the textbook description. Uh, it really is very nicely described by two harmonic modes with a parametric coupling. I'll show you that this can be pushed if you're coupling a strong enough into the strong coupling regime. I'll define what that is for you, why it's exciting, what's fun about it. And then go into the cooling experiments and show you how you can really quantify what the occupancy of these modes are, uh, both in the linear regime and when they've hybridized in the strong coupling regime. So uh, it's this kind of thing. You're making an inductor, a capacitor, the capacitor is <coughs> mechanically vibrating. That gives you your parametric coupling. As I said on the first slide, this is something that's done with standard optical lithography, wafer level processing. If you're at a place like NIST with very nice fabrication, uh, it just works, uh, and that is amazing to me. Yes? Would you separate those? Uh, do you use a table, like a, a dicing saw, or do you cleave along those sort of KOH looking uh, Dicing saw. Uh, the, the lines we leave are just the guidelines for the dicing saw. And we dice first and then release the floppy mechanical structures. So we uh, release the structures after they're diced and it goes through some horrible saw. Any other questions about the fabrication or anything about these? I talked a little bit about it yesterday. There's one uh, uh, Yes. So it's a stupid question, but um, what's the dicing saw? Ah, good. Uh, uh, you have to cut through a sapphire wafer. Sapphire is kind of hard. Uh, one of the not so pretty, but nice ways you can do it is just with a big, uh, I don't know, which kind of saw is it like a machine shop? It's a little saw. Uh, it's a dime blade. Uh, but it's, uh, I mean, uh, it's just a cutting saw where you, you literally uh, chip away and, and cut lines and cut out the columns and rows. And what's nice thing about it is you can align it fairly accurately to cut the dimensions. And when I say accurately, I'm talking about on the sort of uh, fraction of a millimeter scale, nothing crazy in, in the sense of nano lithography, just in, in gross processing. Not to be what he's saying, but it was a uh, the, I think it's a three inch wafer. The individual chips you see here are about six millimeters on side. All right, good. I got questions already. I like it. Okay, so yesterday we finished up by, uh, we just got the system cold and we were starting to look for the effects of the cavity on the mechanics. And I showed you the canonical optical spring and optical damping. These are effects on the mechanical resonant frequency and the mechanical line width as a function of detuning when you have a sufficiently strong pump uh, that's coupling the system. I told you these fit very nicely from theory. You can back out what your coupling strength is. And I told you it's about 50 me megahertz per nanometer. This is something that's modest on the scale of optical circuits. It's kind of off the chart compared to the other microwave circuits. Together, multiply it by the zero point motion, which for these devices, is about four femtometers, four nuclear distances roughly, you get a gene on of about 200 hertz. So this 200 hertz doesn't sound very exciting. It's still small on the scale of the dissipation in the problem. Dominantly, the cavity's dissipation, which is about 200 kilohertz, a thousand times larger. But luckily, as I told you, this can be parametrically enhanced when you drive it. So that's our starting point. That's the effects of the cavity on the mechanics. Now you can say, what's the effects of the mechanics on the cavity. So to probe that, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna use two tones. We're gonna drive with a strong pump, uh, shown with this signal generator here, that's gonna give our kind of coupling tone and mediate the interaction. 
and everything I'm going to be talking about, we're going to be applying this pump optimally rightly tuned so that the upper mechanical sideband is somewhere near Leon resonance with the cavity. <coughs> Pardon me. Then to see what we're doing, what we're going to do is send a second weak probe tone through and just scan that probe tone and see what happens, see what's going on. So if we start off first by turning off the pump and sending a probe tone through and looking and comparing it to what comes back, in transmission, in magnitude, what you see is a Lorentzian and dip near the cavity resonance. That's exactly what you'd expect. For these kind of feed line style resonators, when you're off resonance, nothing really happens, nothing interacts. You just get unity transmission. Everything that goes in comes out. And when you interact with your Lorentzians, well, you interact with the resonance, you get the nice Lorentzian interference. And this is as I've already shown you. So now we're going to keep sweeping the same protone. And what we're going to do is increase the size of the pump. And when we do that, what you can see appears is a sharp peak. And doing things in red and blue maybe is the best idea. I think it's maybe the one on the side. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Don't go to sleep, guys. <laughs> so we've increased the size of this pump which if it were to scale on this graph would be somewhere way over here. We're far in the resolved sideband limit. The upper sideband is moderately in resonance with the cavity, and you see this sharp interference. And it really is interference. It's hard to resolve here. If you see, there's actually points that come up. As you then increase the size of this pump further, there's a couple things happening. The strength of this interference becomes stronger. You can see what used to be down here at just a few percent transmission is now coming closer up to unity transmission. And if you look very closely, you can see the mechanics is getting wider. This is precisely because of the optical damping effect I showed you on the previous graph. This broad peak you see here is just the electromagnetic properties of the cavity mode, its susceptibility. And the sharp peak here is the mechanical susceptibility. And it's the mechanical susceptibility in the hybridized environment with the optical spring and damping. Uh, is there any reason why you're not like, actually like, really on resonance? You're like, off by a little bit. Is that, I imagine that doesn't affect anything, but is that like, a technical reason? Ouch. Uh, <laughs> uh, no. Uh, so it's completely arbitrary. I could have easily uh, tuned this to be exactly on resonance. Okay. Uh, to be perfectly honest, why I chose it to be there is uh, so that it looks more symmetric when I turn up the power. Um, okay. When you're turning up the power, the modes are actually shifting a little bit. But there's no fundamental reason. And I'll show you uh, in subsequent graphs what it looks like if you put that kind of arbitrary in places. But, uh, nothing special. Um, so as I said, the mechanics is getting uh, taller and wider. You turn up the pump more. You can see a couple things have happened. One, now we have kind of perfect interference to give us unity transmission exactly in this very, very sharp, narrow window. And the width is starting to, to increase. So these kind of curves, um, you've probably seen before, not just this week, but uh, decades ago, this looks very similar to electromagnetically induced transparency. Uh, <clears throat> this is an effect um, people were, were coming upon kind of 20 years ago now. And there really is a very strong analogy here. Uh, not completely rigorous, but uh, worth going through. Uh, I'll spend the time going much more through the mechanical uh, induced transparency than this one. But roughly speaking, this is something you get in atomic systems when you have a certain so-called lambda level structure. And you can get interference between pump and a probe if there's light that comes out and can constructively interfere. And you can open up these very sharp windows if you have very sharp transitions in your system. This has been very useful for doing things like slowing down light or stopping light. So now with the optomechanically induced transparency, uh, this is something that uh, has been seen uh, with the microtoroids in these circuits, also with the optomechanical crystals. Uh, and it's really a useful tool, in my opinion, something to add to the toolbox that you might get out of optomechanical systems. You have this very sharp, narrow line. You can turn it on and off with just control pulses of your light. You can turn it on and off in fast time scales. You can tune it left and right. You can change its bandwidth. And so you can really use it to engineer the electromagnetic environment of something else you can imagine. Like I said, it also could be useful for storing photons. 
in these systems, you can slow light down to something on the order of the mechanical uh, lifetime. For my circuits, that mechanical lifetime, you're talking about tens of milliseconds. That means the light that you put in there, you can stop and store for kind of 10 milliseconds before it comes back out. That same sort of delay you could get just with a really long coax cable. But for example, it would have to be a lossless coax cable and running from here to New York City. I mean, you're talking about long path lengths here because of the effective electrical length. It really has to do with the slow uh, speed of sound in the system. It, the mechanics is truly slow. So, you, and the slow light down? Uh, you're basically putting the, converting the light into mechanical vibrations. Uh, and then you can get it back out. Uh, so you're changing the nature of the light in there. Uh, and so if you really wanted to think about what the, the velocity in there, it's something like 10 meters per second. All right, so I've said interference. There's another question. Oh, yes, sorry, it's dark. Yeah, so I thought that the light wasn't entering in the canopy. I mean, when you are uh, on the feet. So you said that you, you slow it. So it has to enter in the, the canopy to exchange the photon, the photon, and now it's slow. So does it enter or is it doesn't? Uh, so it's a very good question. So if I think about light uh, entering exactly at this frequency, and let's say only this Fourier frequency because it's a very narrow window. Uh, it very much does interact with this optomechanical system. In some ways, I can think of it as cycling around in this optomechanical system for milliseconds, and then constructively interfering so it all goes out the way it would have gone out. Um, so it, it really is spending a lot of time here, and that's what I mean when I say you have this very slow phase velocity or these long time scales. It's as if it really, somebody branched it off and it went through kilometers of path length. And then came back out. Yes? So are these photon stores and slow light numbers, the numbers from your experiment, or are those like numbers that can't be achieved by anyone? These are for my experiment. These are for sort of this 10 megahertz mechanical mode with its line width of 30 hertz. Uh, as we saw in the poster session, if you were talking about uh, silicon nitride membranes where the line width of the mechanics is tens of millihertz, these time scales, I mean, you can imagine, are tens of seconds easily. There's nothing fundamental about these numbers. If this is really what you want to push on, you would just push on choosing the right mechanical oscillator. Okay. And then you can put these millihertz line widths up at optical frequencies, which just, uh, I mean, it sounds like an amazing technology to me. Any other questions? So uh, I said there is an interference going on. I'm going to try to step through it a little more in detail, because it, it, uh, there's nothing too tricky, but there is quite a bit of steps in the process. So what is interfering with what? We're going to start with our optomechanical system. Dotted here, I've outlined what the cavity mode looks like, sort of its density of states. We're going to start by applying a strong pump. And we know when we apply a pump, that's some detuning. I've drawn it again, red detuned. It's creating and scattering photons to the upper and lower side end. So now that we're pumping it here, there is light coming out at the frequency we're driving it, also light coming out of these two frequencies. In this case, with just a pump, whatever's coming out here is just because of the thermal motion of the mechanical boat. And in fact, if you turn up and down that pump, you can do the right damping things. You can change the mechanical susceptibility. You can damp it. You can optical spring it. You can move it around. And the important thing we're going to be dealing with is it's always the mechanical mode being damped and sprung by the uh, radiation pressure effects. So now that I have a pump and I have some light coming up here, I can then go in with a probe. So I'm going to apply a second tone of light, in my case microwave. And the important thing is that we're going to apply it somewhere near where one of these mechanical modes are, where light is being scattered or would like to be scattered. Uh, and so I've drawn it here, having the probe somewhere like where I show you the dip was going to appear in the data. And now, as we heard from Keith Schwab, any time that you have two tones going into a cavity, the cavity itself cares about energy. It cares about the voltage squared. And it acts as a mixing element. So these two tones beat against each other. So in fact, I can think about the, the energy in the cavity, or the forces on the drum, as beating at this difference frequency between these two things. And you can see, as I've drawn it on here, the difference between these two things is about a mechanical frequency. So that means there's a very, very strong classical force driving the drum. That driven motion of the drum then means the side bands of the original pump now have a very coherent component. 
So the pump now acquires these huge, coherent, driven sidebands of the driven mechanical motion. And now you can start to see where the interference comes in. You now, at this very specific Fourier frequency, you have light getting there from two pathways. One is the probe light that I put into the cavity, which is shown in blue, and the other is the sideband that's coming off of the driven motion of the drum coming off the pump. These two things are the same frequency, and as I said, they are coherent with each other. They can constructively or destructively interfere. And in fact, at this sideband, they tend to interfere in a way that gives you, uh, undoes your cavity mode. It gives you a sharp dip in your peak or a sharp peak in your dip. On the other side band, the interference has the opposite sign. It tends to do the other thing. So there are these EIT-like effects on both side bands. All the data I'm showing you today is kind of zoomed in over here. There's no good or special reason about that. So once again, just to say it very slowly, very clearly, uh, optomechanically induced transparency is a mechanically mediated interference effect where a probe photon can interfere with the mechanical sideband of the driven motion of the pump. And that's how you should think about all these plots that I'm going to show you in the rest of the data. This interference, and I'll show you that uh, a true interference, it's interfering in the real and imaginary parts, <coughs> it has all the signs of the complex uh, dynamics of Lorentz. Any questions on it? Has the probe to be much weaker than the pump, or does it matter? Uh, so, that's usually what people will say when they do it. In practice, it doesn't make that big of a difference. Um, you're, uh, let's see. What you don't want to start happening is that the sidebands of the probe start to become really appreciable and affect how the pump is getting in the system. Uh, so, it's, but uh, in my practical experience, it's not a big deal. You can have quite a strong pump. Uh, because most of the effects of the pump are not in this narrow window. Uh, uh, sorry, you can have quite a strong probe because most of the strong effects of the probe are not happening right here. They're at sidebands away. And so if you really analyze the problem, there's also some interesting things going on at other Fourier components. But I think that's what would be yeah, non-ideal about not having a probe. <coughs> other questions? Yes? Should the pump be linear, right? I, for microwaves, I can confidently say it doesn't matter. I don't access the polarization, and I think uh, I don't think it would matter in an optical system either. But I'm looking around the room to see if anyone uh, throws things at me. Uh, no, I don't think it matters. I mean, it's all about uh, energizing the system. Right. Uh, in fact, I mean here. Well, it's actually, I think the polarization that the two fields have to be the same, otherwise they will not interfere. Probably. That's would be my guess, right? I, because if there's cross polarization, the interference term will go to zero. Yeah, I think that must be the case uh, when, when they meet against each other. What, what is interesting to me is I don't have to phase lock my pump and my probe here. Uh, the probe, since it's always interfering with the sideband that was created from the same probe, it's kind of self referencing in that way. So if you change the phase between the pump and the probe, these effects would look the same. For the polarization, I don't think it, I think it doesn't matter how it is for the, 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 the probe and the, 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 the drive. Because it's just the energy, uh, the, 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 the switching with photon and photons. I think it does matter. I'm not. Uh, 100% confident either way, but I think what Pierre is saying is, uh, if they're polarizing this <coughs> direction, then when you when you multiply them together and you're trying to get this speed force, there will not be this speed force because the polarization is uh, I think you should leave it as a piece of homework. We want the answer tomorrow. <laughs> we'll leave that as an exercise for the reader. <laughs> So back to the data, uh, again you start with a very weak pump, you're sending a proton through, looks Lorentzian, you get the interference getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And here when I have this 100% uh, interference, I really should picture now the mechanical sideband. I'm driving the mechanics so hard that the mechanical sideband is just as strong as this probe. Uh, what I can also see from this picture is the mechanical line width is starting to get quite wide. 
quite wide compared to the line width of the cavity that's doing the damping of this object. So the question becomes, what would happen as I turn up the power further? And the question is always very obvious after the fact. And as an experimentalist, after the fact means I just turn up the power and see. And if you turn up the probe, or if you turn up the pump even stronger, now what you can see is you've done something special. You've damped the mechanical load. You've coupled to it stronger than any dissipation in the system. And in fact, this is like any two coupled harmonic oscillators with strong coupling. You're now working <coughs> a new eigenbasis. I can't point to this peak and say it's mechanical, and this one and say it's electrical. They're really two hybridized modes. And these are just the normal modes of the new strongly coupled system. And you can see that uh, what used to be at the lower power, a sharp Lorentzian peak in the middle that I can point to as the mechanics, here the line becomes fuzzy, and now I really should think about it in a different basis. In fact, you can turn up the pump even stronger. You can see you can get deeply in the so-called uh, strong coupling regime. Again, this is, uh, should clarify, this is a driven strong coupling regime. This isn't at the single photon level. It's because of our strong parametric drive. But nonetheless, you can really think about the modes of the system talking to each other fast, fast compared to the dissipation. If you turn up the power even more, what you can see is there really is data going across the top of the screen here. There really is unity transmission over this whole window that used to contain this entire cavity dip. Uh, if I zoom out and show you what the data actually looks like, at our highest pump powers, it looks something like this. You have coupling strips. This is G. This is the same G we've been talking about throughout. Uh, about a megahertz. In other words, this is the rate at which the two modes are talking to each other, or that I can imagine in my head uh, excitations and information are being swapped back and forth. The line width of the hybridized system really sees the average of the dissipation in the two systems. It's the average of the cavity <coughs> line width and the mechanical line width. And as we all know in these optomechanical systems, the mechanical line width is completely negligible. So effectively, this just looks like cap over two, which for these systems is a little under 100 kilohertz. And so you can see visually, if you see a graph like this, this is uh, basically the definition of the strong coupling regime. Uh, one good way to parameterize these things that I haven't mentioned and people have mentioned before, it's very much an analogy with cavity QED. You can think of a cooperativity. And all this cooperativity is, is normalizing this coupling rate by the dissipations in the system. How big is G compared to the geometric mean of the of the mechanical dissipation in the cavity. And for these circuits, it's about 10 to the 5. Now, to give you some feel for what these numbers mean or what cooperativity means, if I have a cooperativity of 1, that means I'm able to damp the mechanical oscillator by about its intrinsic mechanical line length. I could cool it by about a factor of 2. If I were pumping on the blue side, cooperativity of 1 is what I need to make it parametrically oscillate make it become a regenerative oscillator, again, because the optical damping effect is exactly the same magnitude as the intrinsic damping. So the fact that this can be many, many orders of magnitude bigger than one, I mean, there's, there's a lot of intrinsic cooling to this system. As I'll talk about in my third lecture, this cooperativity, this is also the figure of merit of quantifying how strong your measurement is, trying to think about uh, if you were thinking about quantum limits, where you are compared to the standard or so-called quantum limit, whether back action effects are important, well, this cooperativity of one is also a special point. It's where you would start to think about being relevant of having imprecision and back action balance each other. And large cooperativity means you could be far on this back action side, really uh, realizing radiation pressure effects. So uh, this is a movie of what the data looks like. Uh, it's plotted in a couple different ways. As the movie's playing, you can also look over here, it's plotted in a two-dimensional plot. And again, this is just pumping over and over, uh, probing over and over the same Lorentzian and increasing the size of the pump in logarithmic steps. And you can see that this optomechanically induced transparency really naturally just evolves into this normal modes plane. They're truly one in the same physics. There's nothing special or no magic bell that goes off at any particular size here. It just changes how we think of the system. Now, as I told you, this coupling rate should go like the number, uh, I, the splitting size should go like the square root of the number of photons in the cavity. This is the parametric enhancement that we have here. So if you plot the splitting size that you have here as a function of the pump power, and now I've changed the units of the pump power, really put it in photon units. 
to say how many quanta of energy are in the cavity from the coherent pump. And the splitting size, you can see, really does follow a power law. It goes exactly like the square root of the number of photons. And it's beautifully explained by the data. Uh, so everything I'm showing you here has been uh, arranging the system so that I apply my pump so the upper side band is exactly on resonance with the cavity, or some people point out almost on resonance with the cavity. Uh, but now I'll show you what that also looks like as a function of detuning. So this is a similar tube <coughs> dot. If I were to take a slice vertically, this is my probe frequency on this axis. So a slice vertically, the color scale is telling you the magnitude. So you should think of going from blue to red as this Lorentzian dip I've been showing you over and over. And now if I change the frequency of my pump so that my mechanical sideband comes into and out of resonance with the cavity, you can start to see these interference effects. So if you were to look at one slice here, you would see there would be a little small glitch right where the mechanical sideband is and then my usual cavity resonance. And if I go in towards the center here, well, if you squint at it, you can maybe say that starts to look like some sort of uh, avoided crossing here. Again, what's easier in these systems is just to turn up the power. And if you do that, now you can clearly see uh, this is evolving into the different bases that I said. You have two strongly coupled harmonic oscillators. That means they repel each other in their level structure. What's also very evident from this plot is you can see the high Q mechanics is very narrow out here and really inherits the cavity's line width as it comes into strong coupling. And then again, as it goes away, as it's uh, getting less and less of an optical spring effect, it's also getting less and less of an optical damping effect. If you turn up the power and zoom out on the X and Y axis, this is kind of the largest split we were able to get with these systems. Again, what's just very nice, because we're starting with microwaves and we have a very narrow cavity line width to start with, and our interaction structure is relatively strong, you can get deeply in the strong coupling regime for a broad range of TV. So again, to show you the movie of what this looks like, these are data not that different from the scale at which we acquire the data really on a vector network analyzer. Just as you sweep one of them, uh, you can measure this essentially in real time and with very good signal to noise. And you can see the really constructive and destructive interference. These truly are two Lorentzian modes. At the top here for this relatively strong coupling, you always get unity transmissions. And you have full control over where that unity window is. I mean, this is a nice tunable object that I can imagine could be very useful as a technology. I've been showing you just the magnitude of the transmission, but we can of course measure the magnitude of the phase, the real and imaginary parts of the electromagnetic field. And both of them are exactly what you'd expect from a Lorentzian. You get the characteristic Lorentzian dip in the magnitude, uh, this kind of S curve in the phase, and the same thing happens for this mechanical interference peak. In fact, it's this very, very sharp peak in the phase that is exactly what I, uh, very sharp slope in the phase. That's exactly what I mean when, you say, when I say you have slow light. Uh, the phase velocity of a wave is really like the derivative of phase with respect to frequency. And you can see if you start with a moderate Q electromagnetic cavity, we have kind of a steep slope here, really enhanced by a factor of about the Q of the cavity. But now when you put an even sharper mechanical mode, well that slope just kind of blows up. And that's where we're talking about phase velocities that are of order 10 meters per second, are thanks to these steep, steep phase versus frequency things we have. And this fits for arbitrary tuning above or below resonance, whether I'm in the strong coupling or out of the strong coupling. Are there other questions here? So uh, I agree 100% with what uh, Keith Schwab warned us about the other day. Uh, when you're looking at data, you should always ask yourself deep down, is this quantum? Is this classical? Would this be different if somebody said h bar to zero? Uh, is it different if I just thought about this with uh, electrostatic voltages and forces? The answer with this data is, is resoundingly classical. Uh, these data would look the same. If the mechanical oscillator were in a big thermal state, if the cavity were in a thermal state, it doesn't really measure what the occupancies of the mode are. And that should become evident from the explanation I gave. What this is really probing is the driven motion of the system, how it responds to forces. So when you're undergoing this optomechanically induced transparency, there's huge coherent pumps driving the cavity, and the two pumps together are driving the mechanics. So this is more showing you what the 
uh, lagging modes of the system are in a driven response. And so what you have here are two harmonic oscillators linearly coupled. Uh, this sounds like the most boring system in the world. The fact that it is parametrically tunable, uh, it's a nice feature. But if you really wanted to start about thinking uh, about doing quantum things with this, uh, maybe using one mode as a basis for, say, quantum computing and the other mode as the other basis, say, if the excitation is mechanical, that's my ground state. And if it's uh, cavity-like, it's my excited state. To do that, I'm going to need one other quantum resource. Something, as my former advisor used to say, to break the tyranny of Gaussian states. You need something that just gets you out of uh, the correspondence limit. So for a system like this, you can imagine a single photon as being that source. If you could put exactly a clock state for one of the system and watch how it evolves, well, that's, uh, that's enough to do. Uh, that's what's called dual rail uh, linear optical computing. Uh, and that's completely within the realm of imagining with these circuits. Yes? What's the correspondence? Oh, uh, so uh, there's lots of ways you can think about it. But it essentially, it's whether I can think about this behavior almost classically and classically, but just adding a little bit of noise on the system. So coherent states um, are one of the, the things you would routinely do. You could think of thermal states. These are all nice Gaussian states. If you were to, say, plot their Wigner function, they're all everywhere. If you start to think about things like Fox states or some of these uh, phenomenal cat states we've seen this week, these are really things that are non-Gaussian, have negative components to the bigger function that wouldn't exist in just a uh, classical frame. Uh, so the correspondence limit is just talking about a special class of states that uh, look almost classical, even though uh, they're not. Um, and the things I have in mind are just like coherent states. Um, Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. You want to just put that to you to in a different way and tell me if I put it right or not. So the, the early in quantum we were told that the quantum function is being like a probability distribution that you have to integrate it over some kind of uncertainty region um, in order to get a probability distribution. Is it like the same thing, a sort of state where if you do that integration, you end up with something that looks very much like the Dupin function originally? I, I'm struggling to, that's not quite what I would say, but I'm trying to decide what I would say. So when I think about the Wigner function, it's kind of this 2D quasi probability function. And if I want to know the probability for any one quadrature, uh, what I have to do is integrate out the other quadrature. Now, for some of these very quantity looking things where it goes positive and negative, uh, the negativeness tells you something special is going on. But when you integrate over it, you get a positive number as we must because it's a probability distribution. Uh, even though the value of the big inference at any one point could be negative. Uh, for, uh, for states that are in this correspondence, like things like coherent states, it's always positive anywhere. I don't even have to rely on the integration to make sure that I get some positive definite number. Um, and I'm sure there's a better way one could say it uh, from other experts that might be improved. showing you that these two modes can be very strongly coupled, very nicely coupled. Like I said, that, that really lets you quantify the size of the coupling you're allowed to get, the hybridized response functions of the system. But we, we don't actually have any idea from these measurements how cold things are. What are the, the distributions? Are these things in the thermal states, in a quantum state? What are they? So we need one other rate in the problem. I've been talking about a lot of rates, kappas and gammas and frequencies. And that's what I'll call the thermal decoherence rate. So roughly speaking, you think about this a couple different ways. Uh, the way I like to think about it is, let's say I did cool the mechanical mode to the ground state, because things were great. Then I shut off my cooling. I don't couple to the mechanical oscillator. I just let it evolve. How long does it take before, on average, one thermal <coughs> cooling pops back into this mechanical oscillator as it tries to equilibrate with its hot environment? So as you might expect, 
the overall time scale for ringing up and ringing down the mechanical oscillator is just the mechanical line. And then the other thing I just need to know is in equilibrium, what sort of uh, occupation number is the mechanical oscillator happy at? So if you're in an environment that gives you an equilibrium thermal number of photons of N thermal, uh, this gamma thermal just says on average how long before the first phonon comes into the problem. So you can see uh, the mechanical line width is the frequency divided by the Q. The average number of thermal phonons, uh, if kT is much bigger than h bar omega, is roughly kT over h bar omega. What's interesting about this expression is you can see the mechanical frequency cancels out. So you're left with this factor here that only depends on two things, the temperature and the Q. In other words, lots of people often ask me, well, why don't you just make your drone in a gigahertz? Why don't you make it at 10 gigahertz and forget all this side band cooling? There's a lot of practical reasons for that. Uh, one, it then really puts the burden on the measurement, trying to measure 10 gigahertz things with their ultra small vibrations would be very hard. But two, this sort of formula tells you what I really want is to go to the lowest temperatures I can ever have, and whatever regime gives me the highest Qs. The megahertz or sort of 10 megahertz regime for me is a nice balance between this and maybe a hundred other parameters and compromise, where you can get relatively high Q. The other point I want to make about this, there's a number of, of groups trying to do optomechanics from room temperature, where the parameters are exquisite enough that you can imagine cooling to the ground state from room temperature. All these systems would ben benefit if they started colder. It would give them more time to do their things, if that's really what you're after. And just to reiterate what uh, Peter said yesterday, in thinking about why trapped ions are awesome and their cooling is so good, I wholeheartedly agree. To me, the reason they're so great is because this number is so awesome. We know they're working at room temperature, but the mechanical cue is effectively off the charts. And that's because it's a free thing just floating in space. And that's what's motivated a lot of this work to levitate more macroscopic things like